we'll primarily be using the four by four inch square tubing, half inch wall, like half inch wall. So that's pretty, pretty strong. And that, that kind of a tractor <coughs> becomes scalable to like bulldozer grade, like a couple of hundred horsepower. If we, if we have materials for four power cubes of 27 horsepower. So we have four engines, we have the pumps that go on those, but um, we could build three or four. My goal was, um, the proposal was about 70 horsepower for this tractor, which would be around that, that number, which would be either like four times 18 um, or three times 27. So three power cubes that are larger, since we have four of the larger ones, it's not much difference to build the 18 between between 18 and 27. So we can do even go above the power that we we're looking at to like 108 horsepower with four power cubes. The innovation there is about making the scalability seamless. To date, we've done power cubes and they're a co complex thing with the entire system built in engine hydraulics cooling automatic ignition filtering fans uh, solenoids <coughs> things like that hydraulic outlets now for this time around a little bit of innovation is that a little bit of innovation is making the hide the, the power cube more seamless in terms of how you can scale it so separating the hydraulic system from the engine pump. So for hydraulic power, you need you need an engine. It's converting uh, mechanical power of an engine into fluid power, which is oil at high pressure, oil at 3,000 psi. So that little tubes, like half-inch tubes, can carry 20 or even up to 40 horsepower. And it's a very modular and scalable kind of a system. So the heart of it is the engine plus the pump. The pump is only this big. This little pump like this handles that 27 horsepower. The hydraulics are quite amazing. Yeah. We do. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I was just, I was just going, I was just going through the concept. Like, I don't want to get too deep, but I was just trying to point out the innovation, like the main innovation point that we're trying to achieve. That innovation point is separating all the support systems that a hydraulic drive system needs into like this thing called the mother power cube, and then the babies, the four of them, are just engine pump. So it becomes actually a much simpler system. And that's something we learned over time that you don't, you don't necessarily have to have this whole power cube with everything in it. You can separate it into the fluids, gas, um, cooling, like all those hydraulic support systems from the engine pump, which makes a lot of sense because the engine pump are the things that, that go bad. So it's better for, so that's, that's the concept. The idea that we're, we're gonna make that more seamless. And it's kind of a crazy idea because nobody does this in the world. Nobody uses hydraulic power, uh, scalable uh, power units in the world that I know of. Uh, just when people build a tractor, it's like 100 horsepower, 10 horsepower, and that's it. That's all you got. So anyway, that's, that's the innovation we're doing. We've got the frames, we've got the power cubes, we've got the drive systems, hydraulics. We know how to do that. And uh, uh, if we all, I mean, if we're actually, if we all work on it, then it'll be like five days that we, we will uh, crank that tractor and run with, uh, yeah, go How ahead. much setup do you think can be done of like cleanup, sort of prep, so that things are kind of lined up to roll um, while parts. people are still doing printers? Can't. No? Not really, I mean, There's not we need to like set up. I mean, the, the printers. Around the perimeters and like, well, just yeah. kind of yeah, yeah. yeah actually that there is i mean we can uh, if we want to we could one option is to divide into two teams because for example there's a steel order coming in today um we can bring the <coughs> so we're, we're gonna use these we're, we're gonna do steel wheels for like lifetime design so we can bring bring out the materials closer like the the engines bring them over bring the older universal rotors which are in the other 
uh, work other uh, storage shed like we can be bringing that all over that that's part of the setup time and and getting out the steel from by the torch table area and stuff like that so well actually yeah people can be doing that if another team wants to do that but uh, well, it's also hard because we have and it's hard it, no you need one side you know how to assemble the printer yeah and then another half that knows the p sort of parts you need for yeah. the chapter yeah, yeah. and the one guy who knows that is you I yes guess. you're the you're the weak link in so yeah, it's not possible to do both it's because totally because what we want to do for the printer. Can Jeff lead the team for the tracker? Does he know enough to? No, he can't do that. Can um, just he can he can, he can gather and stuff. And organizing yeah, and getting you the, the, the well, workflow set. Yeah, we can tell Jeff what yeah. all to bring and all that. Are all um, the welders but are the welders approaching? We have six welders, so part of it is we're getting <laughs> up, getting six welders up and running, and, and people are welding, cutting. Right. There would be a, a lesson, basic tools lesson on welding and other things. Uh, what else to say? But on the printer, uh, we never went over what it means to actually get this thing running with the electrical system, with the controller, and we never went over what it what is absolutely critical for a printer to print well so you can understand it i.e. maybe like the most general quality control points that everyone has to get for their printer to work um, we went through pieces so far at the end of the day you have to talk about integration and what is critical for the thing to work well so a little lesson on that like you know like an hour or two going through so that people are not asking me we can go over this and here's the five or so five or ten quality control points on I would say there's the uh, there's the tightness of the axis and there's how you tighten the belt like those two things and then beyond that is the controller how everything there works but we have actually pretty good documentation on the controller uh, and I can point you out to, we never took a look at what that is but we do have that pretty well um, but those three things if I can transfer that knowledge then th that could propagate but we need to do, we need to go over all of that um, is it possible for maybe like to move uh, the printer setup either here or see the even one or somewhere else where the team can work on that and then we can start uh, setting the area for the tracker? Uh, oh, you can move it to the hab lab, but um, as far as we can, we can move it into the the CD Go Home Three. We need tables. Oh, the sorry, that sounds that's like a. Yeah, we can, but the question is, do we want to do that? Possible to stay up like ten hours going.
here and we said it's possible. We can all move it up here. Uh, I'll move it. Okay, here's, here's my feedback, feedback on that. So, so tractor work is, this gets into metal fabrication. Uh, after you see a little bit of it, you're going to wish you went back to the construction because that is actually easier. Uh, so it's going to be hard work, but we want to cut off at 5 p.m. Uh, my point is that I was joking that this is harder uh, than, act than a construction work. Construction work is hard, and, you know, we got our fill of it. But at the end of the tractor workshop, you know, be crying like a baby wishing you were doing construction instead. No, it's hard, but it's rewarding in a different way. It's rewarding in a sense that, I mean, you see like real tangible, uh, there's a very clear product at the end, whether, whereas with the house, it's like, it tends to drag on, you've got trim, which is like, okay, how far you take that. There, it's a thing that's got a very finite uh, finish point, and it has pretty exciting parts throughout it, like torching and welding <laughs> and everything else that goes with it. But it's just physically difficult because every part there is more than you can carry. Or So you have to use like hoists and uh, pay attention to safety and you've got grinding, like grinders and things that uh, throw sparks. So it's kind of exciting, it's quite exciting, uh, but it's hard work, but it is very rewarding. And uh, so what I would suggest is we, we quit at five, uh, don't kill ourselves into the night, but then at five, uh, from five there's a, there is a few hours for people who are not in an enterprise session to keep going at it if you want to do the printer. So that's just my feedback on, on the workflow. For what? Start what? In the you, ask, you ask the people, when are we going to start? printers, people who are actually at it and really working hard, the other half will be like left behind and stuff. So um, uh, it would be nice to get everybody uh, either having a working printer, because part of it is also we're using those printers. Right now we have a body count of, uh, I think, seven functional ones within the crew here. So making more means uh, 
we want to get to a minimum of 12 once we're printing the axes uh, for the large printer because it's just going to take too long otherwise so that's the thing so we want to we do want to finish some more and even if we did it like after hours and for, um I, I think that number we'd, we'd achieve 12 um but i i'm inclined to say yeah let's do just a little more on a printer of course because uh, uh we're close and uh the tractor is going to be hard work and i my suspicion is that by the end there's going to be like half the people left working on it because it's hard work so um we're not gonna have enough bodies <coughs> Uh, conserving, conserving our energy throughout the project, being smart about how we rest and, and like quit on time, I think that is important because the more fresh we are. And it's also the, the risk, like the danger, physical danger, like you're working with heavy stuff. So you want to be careful that if you get really fatigued, like don't be in a shop doing all this work because it's dangerous. The idea there was with a lot of people, it's much lighter and more fun uh, and you don't get fatigued also for safety so like the, the idea of the extreme manufacturing was because a lot of this stuff is is quite heavy uh the short times where you can focus intensely that's important uh, for safety reasons as well so that's that's my feedback on the process so i mean my goal would be to um focus on the tractor and my logic is that And, and by, by the way, way there's, there's a three-week three tractor build this uh, November 14, or two-week two tractor build at November 14. So we're going to revisit this at the very, very end, with based on what we learned here. So what, what is the difference between that? I mean, other than that, we have like 144 horsepower, like in terms of the design of the tractor. Is there anything? You know, I mean, everything. everything. It's like it's. it's I mean. It, in, in essence, essence you, you could say it's, it's all the same, but it's, it's got, got wheels and it's got, got engines, but how it goes together and all the geometry, it's all different. I mean, it's a different model. Different model, next iteration, yeah. uh, different hydraulic control scheme, like, like all the details, details are different. different. Different power cube, topology, uh, different way to, like, steel wheels, different shafts, uh, building upon shaft systems. So there's a, bit of, a little bit of innovation happening. Uh, which, which we all are participating in, which is really cool. cool. That's, That's the super, super cool part. <coughs> like, like just, just like, like the, you know, the, the scalable, the very scalable power unit, unit which we already proved that yeah, yes, you can scale power cubes, but now we're taking it to the next level, level things, things like, like that, that um, making it better, better, faster, stronger. That's the idea. Uh, the, the idea, by the way, I mean, is how does this relate to anything? This, I mean, this is a real machine that we're going to be using for preparing sites for the CD go home. Like that's that's the specific intent. It's a Bobcat equivalent. Uh, equivalent, equivalent to a high-performance high performance bobcat that can lift a lot, has about 8,000 pounds of pushing force. Yes, yeah. yes, it's it's, it's, uh, it's intended, intended to be a highly functional machine. Uh, all, all the learning up to now, the, the micro track actually works well. We still keep using the live track uh, six, which is out there. Like for example, today we use it to unload and and do some, you know, carrying stuff around or some bucket work or lifting things up. Um, but it's, it's not, not it's not an optimized, optimized machine. It's, it's slow and, and all that. It's, it's a prototype, so we're moving on. And, and, and but very close to to high performance. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yes, you can easily put a PTO motor or a three point on the back of it. Uh, we can. We we like doing a a PTO. Motor means just mounting that and mounting it. We don't have the parts for a three-point hitch, but we do have the ability to do a, a PTO motor on the back. So using hydraulic drive. So we can run. Like say you got a baler. We already like the baler that makes the square bales. We use that with live track already. All you need is a PTO motor and a way to drag it. So uh, things like that you can do. We're focusing on uh, like, like Bobcat, Bobcat quick attach on the front, so you can use all the implements that come with the already existing Bobcats. So 
that's that. that. The, the agriculture part at this point was kind of secondary, but I mean, you can readily retrofit a three-point hitch if you want, or you could do just a, another form of a lift on the back, like, uh, like for example, for key line, key line plowing something where you have cylinders for down pressure and stuff like that, that's easily retrofitable because the, the transparency of the frame is designed so you can attach anything to it. That's part of the design that's it's highly flexible to be modified. Yep. Yep. Okay, okay, so, so uh, when uh, you need some hours to put into it, we don't have those hours right now. It takes a certain number of hours to build one. Uh, we don't have the time for that. We could do, uh, we'll be very glad if we finish this one and make it work and all that, but to do two, that's double the work. It's not something we can do right now. We can, the, the way it works, so this is still experimental, we're experimenting, right? So there's a difference between experimental builds and where you have absolutely everything nailed with full CAD, and then you can actually take like a couple of days to build it. But once again, with a, with a big team, like 12, 24 people, uh, we're not there. We're actually experimenting and making new things happen. So before you take the new things that we're building right now, you've got to shake down the issues that have come up with them. So it will work better than last time, but what else will we learn so it's, that's the difference between prototyping and a production machine. It's not a production machine right now. By end of November, with who doing it? Uh, I don't know. It depends. Uh, basically be on your own because there's not going to be a lot of people here. Uh, I don't know how that would look, but you can pretty much do on your own. But I mean, as far as everything else, we're building a ton of other stuff. We're building the large printers, we're building the shredders, we're building the torch table. So to... to yeah. Right, right. Um, the, the question, the bottom line question is how much time does it take to build one of these things? And it's probably, um, the, the, the part, it will probably take you 160 hours to do it, of work time, uh, to do a, a basic machine. Uh, it would be like, um, I would estimate about 40 hours once we get that design down pat and we know absolutely everything about it and we're going off blueprints, not creating things on the fly. So that's the difference. You're going to get like, 4x to 10x the difference. Just like, for example, the first power cube I ever built, it took me one month of full-time work to do it, including design time, maybe six weeks. Now I can build one in a single day. So that's the difference. There's like a 10x to 100x compression of build time once you do all the techniques that we learn. But the first time you do it, it's going to be a lot of time if you're just experimenting with things and trying to make things fit. That's, that's how it works. If you spend all that time here to do that, you could get you could get something probably get something decent working. Um, if you intend to continue on that, that would be a good good first step. But uh, it depends how much energy you have to do that. And on yeah, that's possible. So where is the ship going? So let's go to. Let's go to QC on a, on a 3D printer. So uh, let's see. Let's let's go. Let's just draw draw a few things. So the three things you want to know is we went through the. So I'm just gonna start a doc. Um, critical QC points. I know you guys are talking about the. Uh, and, you know, after the and stuff like that. I don't know how we're going to approach this in terms of, you know, everyone can't, you know, chop and describe it at the same time. 
that, but um, because to, to, to Wesley's point, like none of us, at least most of us, couldn't really even dream about something this outside of here. Um, if, if, if there was a, a benefit, is there any um, advantage of starting early? Like us committing and say, hey, you know, Marshall, if we need to be here at you know, 9 on the dot or 8 on the dot, we need to be to make sure that you know, you get it to grab the cane. It is 9 on the dot, though. Huh? It is 9 on the dot. I know, but, 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 but people, people aren't always there and people, people don't show up on time usually. Yeah, everyone has different, you know, motivations. In terms of their interest in, you know, some of the projects to date, like, you know, since I've been here, I know when I'm out there and I and everyone's out there, I just time to have them out, you know? But my point is, for this particular bill, because as I stated, most of us could have been doing this outside, but is there any advantage to, you know, trying to start early going that there are other things we need and we have people, you know, to the enterprise track or doing different things you're trying to do? Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think the ball might be different. Uh, it would be nice to maybe give them our extra hour. Yeah, yeah but it's, uh, yeah. I think we have other other weekends. Yeah. Well, and always not to do both. You know, to do both. And, and on that note, Marshall, is there anything from like an, a commitment or you know accountability standpoint that you need from us to really make this happen? Because <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm here because no one wants to, no one wants to blow this, you know what I mean? Like, like, if this doesn't happen, I think of all the things we know that, like, for me, I came here specifically for this in terms of why, why justify yeah. spending the money because yeah. I knew I couldn't do it anywhere else. Yeah. yeah. Well, who's, who's got, got the answer, answer to that one? one? <laughs> I couldn't sleep until two because of Netflix, so. Hey! I was up at five in the morning and so okay, fine. No more Netflix you know, one time. Yeah, you know, yeah. I had to blow off steam last night, right? Yeah, yeah but just use headphones, so it'll be way easier for the rest of the house. But I'm saying that for me, like, I, I work for people around the world. So, like, I've had calls every day this week with my finances on the radio. Usually their work days are on the morning. So, every time in the morning, I have to be on call for work. I can't do this to me earlier than I was taught. I just can't do it. And so, if they're critical, if everybody else makes the connection, it's already serving. I'm just going to down things that are critical, right? And so for me, you know, the, the critical information, I, w I would prefer and I would love to call the critical information was delivered in the time period that was used to be. That would work best for me being able to maintain my employment. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I would love to be able to do it earlier, but I know that I can't. And I know if I'm coming in to have a day every day, I'm going to fall so far behind this. I'm not going to do it. It doesn't have to be a time piece to uh, that's why I said, you know, what what do you need from us, you know what I mean, in terms of uh, making this happen, you know? Uh, well, all the sessions where I mean, it's focused and, and well fed. I think that's, that's what we need to go. We can hope to address the the food, like, uh, the Mennonites will just start ordering more stuff. The second part is that there's two types of people that come here. One is more entertainment, and two is more people who are interested in the economic output of this. So that's, I think that's the, that's the challenge we're dealing with. Some people like yourself, uh, you're like, man, let's do it, bam, all day and night. Other people are not, so there's that, that issue. In practice, it turns out to be that like at any time is like half. Printer was actually a little different, but it's like the, you know, when you plan for a lot of people, uh, the reality is like kind of plan on half the people really working, so uh, that's the bottleneck. Right now, I mean, we don't have enough people to like, for the tractor build. It's we'd have to work hard to do it. It's going to be harder for for a smaller number of people. Uh, for the 3D printer, I think the the after hours thing, like if we get clear on the, I mean, so the good news on the 3D printer is we did a lot of the quality control throughout, like just the very basics that are critical. And now if we can propagate that to the rest of the build and do the controller, which is well documented, which we'll go through just right now, um, I think we're quite close to it. I mean, I finished my printer, we can basically look at what I did and then, okay, upload the code and here's how you get it to print the first time. So that's, that's what we can do. Um, but all of you should be able to get there. Uh, the one, okay, if we talk about the improvement that I would like to see and I've never seen is people taking notes. It's like, the way that memory works 
It's like, we don't remember anything. So if I'm here s sitting for like an hour or two and nobody's taking notes, we're getting like 5% out of this talk. I'm doing so, I mean, yeah, I'll do text I don't know, that's, I'll do, I'll do, that's my Maybe big... Maybe someone else does, but I do text-to-speech. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah. I Things really like when we go over... Oh, uh, this is these are the dimensions. That's how we do it. I get asked in a, in a session. I get asked ten to twenty to thirty times the same question. When we explicitly went over that, I said, "Pay attention. This is important." Um, like the retention, I don't know how to make it work. I mean, that's that's a stumbling block right now. I see it. Uh, I always have, and I don't have it on me right now. But I have my fat ass notebook. That's the twenty four, uh, twenty seven. Um, that's how I can learn much more rapidly. But I, I, that's only like that's one detail. I would, propose for anybody to just get a piece of paper and like like say we're building a tractor what's the dimension of this thing we got to build write it down you're not going to remember yeah. it's like people don't remember stuff and learning is repetition it's like just blew me away how that how um how that was an issue at this time i, I don't know what to do about it it's I can you be kinda, really clear in calling people in because you would say i'm doing something and hot people wouldn't even hear you yeah so of course um, they're us Yes. Yeah. Yes, that that too. Yeah, yeah tr could try to to be more and more deliberate. It, it really kind of requires, um, yeah, very deliberate effort to make that happen. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's in people's culture to take notes. Um, that's a difficulty. I think like with the internet culture, we kind of get less and less into actually writing things on paper. I think paper is a critical tool. Also, you got the digital part, but paper is important too. However, it works for you. Um, so that's the only other thing I can mention. Um, but yeah. follow steps because they need more hand holding to know what that step actually means it's tricky um yeah uh, when we built modules there was a, a, a tablet that showed the dimensions of whatever module there was that one nice. Anthony. okay so Anthony knew how to do this uh, then he left and we're not doing it anymore uh, i so think my laptop no yeah but we're not using it at the level of intensity we're using it when we're building modules uh, so nobody is really opening the document uh, one or on site. Why is that? Which document? The one like well, we can go, for example, so the challenge with documents, so like, for example, there's a complete wiring guide that you can follow right now, and I could disappear, and you could probably even do it. Um, but still, with this, you know, I, I want to be there, and I should be there, but this is kind of this pictorial thing, because like, for example, like, some one person might not even know what the hell this is. Okay, and this is also for the pro. But the wiring is identical for the universal. So uh, with a basic, yes, this is the universal that we're working on. But the controller is identical. It's got the identical components and all of that. So here's a complete thing. It's got a video for every single step. Um, and there's a total, total of 20. 
uh, you can follow that. You can look at the videos. Um, at least at the level of um, like what goes where. So uh, yeah. So there's stuff like that. But the thing is, like this was made for the pro. We need to adapt it for the universal because it's like somebody might not know what the hell that thing is up there. Like what's like how do you correspond that to what you have on the universal there's still xyz but it looks different on the pro than the universal as long as you can get oriented on what that is the the controllers are the same the, the components are the same so just a quick comment so yeah like, you know, i don't i don't live in this world on a regular basis and so yeah. like i don't have much of a background in 3d printing or anything i just want to jump in and say hey what are we doing and the first thing that we did was like all right step one attach this to this right so i feel like if we start out with that high level overview you know, uh, documentation here, the resources that are available, here are the critical con uh, quality control points, etc. And then jump into the details, and it's easier to be able to make inferences, mm -hmm. and make decisions independently, uh, having an understanding of what it is that we're attempting to accomplish. Yeah. So perhaps for the other modules moving forward, when we, you know, we're, we're designing and moving other things, if we can help to maybe do some more context setting, mm -hmm. that would be helpful. So I feel like I asked you about a lot of things that I could have inferred, but I didn't have the big picture, right? Or I didn't know the documentation was there. Yeah. And when I'm not here, I would have in another world. I didn't have time to really jump into it. You know, I would have loved to yeah. cover all of this independently. But the reason I dedicated like 60 plus days to physically being here is to be able to immerse myself as much as possible in this world. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that works. With the caveat that a person who, you can provide that overview, but if it depends on the level of person a person's experience because then one person will be like oh yeah you know don't waste my time with the other person who won't even get it and stuff it's it's pretty challenging but we could do that but it's like the feedback so far throughout this you know this summer has been it's like i try to do that but i felt like people are like what's this all all about um because it really depends how much um how much you know already about it that's that's the challenge there and the documentation is is the thing that there should be documentation for every level of, from the very simple, like this is simple stuff, this is, this is a power user, this is somewhere in between, but we can only do so much. Um, and there's, that's where the idea was, okay, people who are here spend some time, some time documenting and actually uh, record the technical knowledge that's being generated. And that's, uh, we're not, I don't think we're doing too great on that. Overall, it's like a long, drawn out process where only a few people end up doing anything meaningful towards that but I mean I don't know how to get people to do that because people are just so busy with their lives for a reason it's like you're only going to be motivated to do it really well if you're actually going to consider doing this for a living so that's, that's kind of how we switch to the apprenticeship and, and trying to get people to actually do this for real <clears throat> so that's actually their, their bread and butter and stuff like that and that's where it has to go and that's what we're kind of trying to push for. Um, that's, that's the idea. And by the way, uh, yeah, uh, t so today we, we got to quit at like 4.45. The, the enterprise team is going to the city to, to look at lots and talk to an architect and stuff like that because, I mean, one of the core outcomes of this whole summer was that at the end of it, we were really far in terms of getting the, the CD go home as a product and produce that for, for customers. That's the idea, to, to swell the supply of low-cost housing as a way to do it. And there's a lot of different controversy on how to how to approach solving housing but um, actually the the latest that we know is that it's actually an, an unpopular thing because if say you go into a neighborhood and you do something uh, that's lower cost you're gonna piss off you're gonna help a bunch of people but you're gonna piss off other people so politically the the people you're gonna piss off are typically the ones that are politically connected like the people that live there and their property values might go down because there's there's houses coming in for a hundred K when their mortgage is for 180k and then that devalues their mortgage and all of that so it's like uh, we're solving that issue of access to housing where, where we help in general but uh, that's the that's the that's wh that's where we're going like that. that that's a big outcome ways. you put a, a house that costs cheaper to build yeah. in a nice neighborhood that's worth a lot more yeah, so that's actually and, actually and at that, that time how are you solving housing because everything goes up to market rate and it's no longer affordable I so mean, that's the thing in boulder someone just built a container house that has six 40 foot high cubes in it and they just sold it for 3.6 million dollars and it's got probably less than 100k of material in it. <laughs> 
Just yeah, it's the the issue is quite challenging. It's a good challenge, but we're gonna f up the housing market if we succeed at this. That's the thing. It's kind of an interesting thing. Well, no, it's a thing that you gotta wrap your head around because nobody like everyone loves affordable housing except not. You know, it's it's a it's an interesting game to play. But anyway, um, getting to the tractors that rumble to to get there and, and the printers that get us the parts. Let's go to QC. Yeah. Okay. So QC, we went, I think uh, everybody kind of got the hang of, here's the, we got data, two, two pounds are under for the stiffness, and you want to make sure it does not wobble. If you can push it from one side or the other, so maybe like let's write this down explicitly, like the ultimate test for all your three axes is, like, because we can go through like a hundred steps, but let's, let's point out to like the top three, because in this game, I think it's a lot of TMI for based on where people are in this so I would say do the push test like two-sided push test um, so okay so let me uh, what is that so you've got the axis uh, you got your carriage which is in the middle right so that's your axis and by the way let's share this so it's editable everybody can actually edit uh, change it's the link is in um, in the chat box if you're on zoom here so you can access that um, but what's the idea there push it like right there so let's fatten up that arrow push it there then push it there and see whether you got a torquing on that axis so ideally you want no torque meaning like no rotation like it doesn't start to jam up um, so ideally you're under two pounds and even like one or less and when you push from one side um, you don't see a visible torquing like like this thing like you don't want it to push you push from one side or the other you don't want that you don't want this to rotate you want it to behave as if you're pushing from the center and it's moving straight um, so observe for that because uh, you can definitely get super loose, like less than two pounds, but you can do that very easily at the expense of being so loose that you're just wobbling. Um, and that will determine the quality of your prints. Like if you can see visible like one millimeter uh, wobbling, the the real figure of merit is compared to what? Like how big are the print threads? We're printing with huge nozzles, which are like 1.2, 1 1.2 1 .2 millimeter. So it will work. It will get you kind of like rough prints with like one millimeter offsets uh, if you've got like a little visible wobble I mean it'll still work for like a big part but you know it won't be as clean as possible and super neat so do this two-sided push test uh, while while under two pounds of friction so we measured that was cool we, we actually measured the friction we got numbers for that in our data collection form there um, do that that's the first thing so we went through this extensively like if you get get all your axes like this you're gonna have really nice clean prints what else can fail so uh, so let's go to QC2 um, we checked yeah go ahead Uh, I mean, it'll probably increase a little bit because you got more weight, but try to be under two pounds for the most excellent results. I think you'll probably still work with like four or five because we said we've got 18 pounds of available force. So as long as we have that, but what the, the, that does mean, the torque curve of a motor is like this. It's, it's not the same torque at all speeds. When you're very slow, you're near full torque, but if you try to go really fast, you have only half the strength of your motor down to like 30 percent at very fast speeds so that means the more friction you have you won't be able to achieve the highest highest speeds uh, that's that's the limit so you can print slowly and if you're only doing like 25 or 50 millimeters per second perfectly fine if you want to try to push it to things that you could print with like say 200 millimeters per second like 4x the speed you're going to see your layer shifts, which means that you're printing and then you, you jump steps and the, the, the layers shift and 
all that. So, uh, so QC2 is belts. So let's look at the very details of this because we're going to have about a, a hundred to five hundred of this question throughout the day. But there's like three points. So one, uh, location of uh, location of of cylinder, the belt cylinder. So you know what we're talking about? The cylinder, the, the round part. Location of cylinder is by the carriage closure bolt. What's that mean? That's the plate that stops the the barrels from uh, popping out. That prevents the bearings from popping out. So say that's the carriage. Uh, you got the carriage, you got the the four bearings in there, so they're inside there. So there's four bearings <laughs> inside. Can you give us access to the Yeah, it should be... Uh, Anyone can find an edit. It's uh, in a link in a in a, in a Zoom call. Really? Uh, do a refresh. Uh, refresh the page. Yeah. Hmm. Don't mind. Are other people getting into it? The document is fine. Okay. Um, So maybe paste it in again. Uh, if you go to go to my login, you can go to 3D printer. If you go to MJ log, just click on the first first link. Um, so we got the bearings. There's a carriage closure, and there's a bolt there that holds the carriage closure. So your belt peg goes next to it. So that's the closure. I'll shrink that down. Uh, the one bolt, okay, there's, that's, let's make that into the, the actual nut. No, maybe not. We'll draw the, the little bolt. So the bolt that, I'm gonna draw it larger and then shrink it. So that's your bolt that, that um, it's the, that little bolt you've got, that's, that's actually what it wants to be is more like this. It's the one with the hex, five millimeter hex key, it's the M6 thread. So your little bolt that you have there, put the, put the peg, um, next to your, your belt peg which from the profile looks like this here that's your belt peg put it next to that bolt that's step part one um, why not put it on the other side because then if you try to put the clamp on that side it'll be riding on a bolt and it can move here it's important so part two belt is by is between carriage closure bolt and belt cylinder so can somebody draw that in what I just said where's the belt that runs because there the belt is going to kind of cross through that hole in there be caught with the belt cylinder on one side and the clamp on the other can somebody draw that where what i just said in point two so that's one belt copy that for the other belt That'd be awesome, except crickets. 
we, we could try it, but there's a lot of crickets in that game. It is a good idea. Let's try it. It does help us to see the documentation as a resource and not just mention it. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's all it's all on Wiki. If it doesn't if it's well, not so there, it doesn't exist. Whatever the documentation is, and right. It's enough. Right. It's all over the place. It's it's largely technical documentation. So it's like for people who are developers, really. It's not user friendly, but that's where another person can come in and make it user friendly. So. Um, so carriage closure bolt is that thing, right? So is that drawn right? Well, uh, no. The lower belt should be in the goods and car that um, carriage closure bolt right. and, the, and the, uh, the plastic there. whatever. That's it. That is correct. So to point, point to that, belt so that belt there does that make sense it's between it's between the carriage closure bolt and belt cylinder this is the belt cylinder we're getting there Right? So now let's move on to the next. So that's two points. First of all, you know which side the, the cylinder goes on, and then which side of that cylinder and carriage closure the belt goes on. Next, step three is the clip. So where does the clip go? Same belt as the cylinder. Yep. Same belt side. But opposite on the Okay, edit. Edit the thing to make it clear. Um put it then against the carriage. Yes, put it right against it. And then we're gonna get to how you achieve that. So there's the clip. So write that down. It goes right next to the carriage, no space. And there's a very specific way you can get that pretty much perfect. So first of all, let's move it over next to the carriage. Move the clip over to the carriage. That little, so like right there, you see that little crack? Can't have that, that little crack. See, it might be touching here. Let's see, that's exactly what happens and messes things up. You can't have that. You actually gotta have, what? Can, can someone modify that profile? Well, uh, it has one flat side, go like this, go like that. And then that's, that's like 100 microns down there, that's all right. But get it like as close as you can. Okay, so now the question is, how do you get that to do that? How do you do that? Um, no, I did it with a pair of pliers on the end of one. And yeah, but let's, so let's talk about on the clip itself, which side is it facing? Up, down, twisted one way or another? Uh, or the, the hex side out. Hex nut or hex head? Um, the, the, the Allen key head. Allen key head, Allen which key is head. Yes. How, if one's using 
that hardware. The, I guess that's you got it, yeah. Up. Allen key head. Um, to the outside of the carriage. It's an M6 by 16 bolt. Thank you. M6 by 18 bolt. I don't think you have M6 by 16. Faces where? Um, head to outside of the carriage. Away from belts. Yes. Does, do people understand that one? Yes. This is where, like, we're going to go in there, and I bet you half the people are not going to understand it. So what's not clear about it? I, I kind of saw, like, yeah, maybe. Sure. For me, what's not clear is whether or not the teeth of the clip should be facing downward or it should be facing upward. Okay. So let's define that. Hmm? Pictures. And to be clear, the, the purpose of that is is it uh, more accessibility in the future, or is it is there an uh, operational issue if the? Uh, it's both. It's how how you can access it to build it, and then how well it works. It's both, both build and function. We're designing it so that you can easily get your wrenches in there, not like. Uh, um, if you're in a know, you'll appreciate that we're trying to make bolts accessible. Engineers do not make bolts accessible. We're trying to pay attention to this. So if you have the head out, you can put a Allen key right there as opposed to from the other side where you got the other rods and the belts in the way. So that's the reason for it. Um, let's look at, so let's look at, um, uh, Another doc, which is say D3, D, U2, universal two. So let's look at the belt pegs and all that. It's actually uh, build instructions. It's in there. And by the way, the extruder build is quite detailed, so you can take a look at that. This is. This is D3D Universal vers version 2, version 3 if you go on the wiki. Um, it's just building upon this, so it's most of it is here. Okay, so you got... Let's, let's click on belt. Should be an index. Yeah, right. Uh, so go to... So it's control F belt. So this defines what the parts are, belt clamp and belt cylinder. Okay. This goes into this. This is explains the belts. Winding the belts. So do we have some, so here's for example, a picture of what we talked about just now. That's 73. But the point is that 73 out of many more numbers, but it's like, it's TMI. It's like, you gotta follow it. So. There's only, like, in the cheat sheet notes that you can take, you can only take some of the most critical things, but you don't know which things are critical. It's a very hard problem. So, but here it's a picture of what we just described. So what we can do is do a little screen capture and make a picture of that happen. Um, see step 73 in the build manual. So... There's that. Uh, this is what we just talked about here.
and then going further okay that's not right there uh, and, and maybe that's before it's not right because it's both yeah bottom. it's a little harder to get it in so I would prefer we have the head no wait where are we there yeah not that's not the same piece because the bolt actually sinks into the clip there yeah it's actually the same piece it's the ones we have right now is enlarged there's a nut on the other side of that was that an example of what it was not supposed to look like because the bolt was on the inside Yes, so let's find one that it does maybe reflect it. So that those instructions need to get updated. Uh, the other way would work would work. It's a little harder. So if you're trying to get uniform results, you wanna we wanna migrate to what we're describing now. So I don't talk much more. That that's all we've got there, and I. And if we look at those details, I show 74, it says, slip the belt clamp over the two belt sections, insert a bolt and nut and tighten. I don't even mention which direction, but direction, let's make it uniform. The head of the bolt should face the opposite belt. Well, yeah, I do, and that's I wouldn't do that anymore. And the nut should face the outside. Or maybe we do want to do it. So let's revisit that. Which is which do you think well, I mean, which is easier for somebody? Like that was actually easier for me at that time. Uh cuz what you do is you tilt that belt and you can get your Allen Allen key into the nut the the bolt head. It turns out if you actually think about that if the the bolt head is on the other side, you have the rod right there, so you actually have to turn it a little more. I don't know. So it's so which one which one do people prefer? Which one looks easier? That's a practical head out? I definitely like the head out. Okay, head out. So we're gonna take a thing take a head out and then also to jam the the belt down deep into the groove. Yes. You kinda need it the other way up. Yes. To be able to get something in to actually pinch it tightly properly. Yes, yes. I would. Uh, so you'd take the belt and s squeeze it down like that? Or would you go and like clamp and go down on a belt? No, because I found if I put it on, I actually needed to get something to then push the belts down yes. into the feet to get them down deep so that it was actually clamped well. Mm -hmm. Which if I had have done that over the top, there's in a lot of works, many of the film drives, it would not have been easy. Okay, so let's let's document that. So we're gonna say face to the outside, away from belts. So next point is the clip, the belt clamp. The U up or the V up. Faces with U with V up. Do people know what that means? Yep. Um, and then? You up, but with the head with towards the outside. To the outside. Mm -hmm. so, that's, so yeah, the clamping the side facing up basically is what you're saying. The part that clamps the V part that clamps should be up. Yes, yeah, it's facing up. Faces with V up so you, that you slide belt down into it, right? Uh, w dictate what I should write belt clamp faces. With V up so that. So you slip belt into it, down into it. Sounds good. Just not to get too crazy, but if we're talking about like the Z axis, right? Then our up down <coughs> is uh, no longer down. 
that's what I was saying. Yeah. Towards there the, you go. the top of the carriage. Top of the carriage sounds great. Yeah. That's a good, good distinction. Okay. Mm hmm. And then what? <clears throat> then it's the, the step take. So that's this is when you tension it now. So you slipped it down. How do you tension it? You push the block against the carriage while pulling on the exit in, the extra um, bit of belt with a pair of pliers. Or the amount of pliers or I don't know. That's to the carriage while you pull the belt end um, yeah the belt end yeah away away from the carriage yeah. is that how you tension it more um, there's more there's I more. Mean, yeah I initially that's a way to do it but pushed it there's more down so it was tight in the V Mm -hmm. So that as you pull it, it actually grips it nicely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's good, and it's you need to make sure that all of your your um, your set screws holding your rods are tight before you do all this, because you start tightening and you haven't done that, you're gonna yeah. crank down your. So, that's the alternative. so before doing all of this. Yeah. Fix your axis length. That could be by set screws, could be by mounting plus set screw on one side. It could be by the Z, by putting a the cap, on. The cap, which is the, the, spool, the holder. spool holder on top. And that locks the, the length of it because the other length goes, bottoms out in the base piece. So I'm going to say, before doing all this, fix the length of axis. Typically by set screws. To make this process easier, uh, I, I, is there a, a reason why the belt and the uh, metal rods need to be at the same axis? It's not true for cars, for example or for other instrumentation. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it would make it easier to, to slide them a little bit so that you can do the, the locking, interlocking in a different way and strengthen from the side rather than have to go in there on the, on the line. I don't know if this makes sense. Huh? It require a cat design. So that you slide, slide the belt down and then you lock it on one side and then you pull from this other side. So trading the design for Built. I don't know if this would make it easier. Uh, I don't know what you're doing. You're, you're saying what are you trying to do? Like screwing it into the side of the carriage. Yeah, or, or one more, some locking mechanism. So, what, what was difficult about this way of doing it was actually getting there tensioning it. Right? Like, can, can it be fixed? Paul, that is design? so awesome. The only way we can verify whether this has any merit is by doing it because yeah. it looks great on paper but I can tell you right now the challenge there is how you're going to tension it yeah you can pull on it you, yeah exactly you pull from the side instead of having to lock in with the fire okay and turn. well exactly where tell me exactly where you would pull from etc and demonstrate it like there's a lot of detail that goes into it. you yeah. have to demonstrate it to actually see that, that this actually works or not right but you can't, I can't demonstrate it without printing a different kind of piece Right on. That's why you're building a 3D printer. Okay. Okay. Mm. You want to do it? Perfect. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. Look, don't dump everything on Ken because he's <laughs> very, very busy. I don't know how strong those belts are. If you drill a hole in them. No, you can't do that, man. Yeah. That part won't that. work. Oh well, yeah. Maybe um, not the there's details. Devil's yeah. in the details. Okay, let's not. Go so. Into the, the sticks here. Okay, let's do what we've got for now. So. Uh, so we said pull, pull it, but easier way is to grab it with the vice, the, the needle nose pliers and twist it. That's the easier way to do it. 
Twist it. <coughs> twist it. Just twist it. If you grab it and twist it with needle nose pliers, <coughs> you'll do. You can do much more force. In fact, you can go so hard that you can break the belt. Uh, by hand, you have so much strength. You can do it. You'd really have to pull hard to get what it's easy to do with twisting of pliers. Yeah. So much sense. Yeah. Got it pretty tight, yep. Because you got some veiny pythons, and you you you, you know you can use your hands. Yeah. Other people might not do it. Might not be able to do that. Yeah, but but it's easier. That makes so much more sense. Yeah. Is there a so, way to know you have the right tension on the, uh, the belt? Okay. Good question. So how do we determine that? It has to strum at a C minus. <laughs> <laughs> Pull. So, so push the clamp next to the carriage while you grab. So let's say grab. Well, no, we're going to do this. Since it would be like... That's like how people might think about it. Um, let's go strike through that and while you grab with pliers with needle nose pri and twist with and there's more detail with needle nose pliers actually touching the belt clamp so you're t pushing against it Against the carriage. Okay, tension. Tension data. So what are the two limits? How do you know it's too soft? Like the strumming, that's cool, but you need to have a, a meter. That would work because you can't you can't do that. You can hear the sound nice, but say you don't have that. What's uh, what are the two? It's useful to think about limits. So what's the strongest you can get? It? Let's look at that limit. What's the? How tight can you get it before it's too tight? What will happen when it's too tight? It won't move. It'll, it'll, it'll get it'll, above two pounds. It'll torque the bearings in your motor to wear things out. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it'll be, but the first visible sign is that you're, in terms of what we can quantify right now, it's going to weigh up, go way above two pounds of friction. So if you had it like at two pounds, and you know you can see it move easily, and then you tension the belt, and it's very hard to move. Uh, measure it, and don't ask me. Measure it. If it's, I would say max. I mean, don't allow it to go above four like three maybe so we said two already but here we're, is where we're actually tensioning things that was two was a start so we still have a little way to go I wouldn't go above like three but make so we'll say maybe after tensioning make sure it's like three three pounds uh, I wrote a little guide on the next page mm -hmm. we'll take a look at it if it makes sense for just a step-by-step -step how to place everything and what order to do it in Sort of like we're doing now, but we're also listing all the points in the first page. Um, so I stumbled on another way to catch it that was more accurate when without the plier, by doing it this way. So instead of pulling what we're doing here, mm -hmm. it only works if the knob, the terminator is on the inside. Mm -hmm. So you come in, you push it through to the other end, mm -hmm. you pull here, and as you pull, this gets compressed, so you get zero spacing. Uh -huh. on the on the side, that's right. and then you can do it with two hands. Yeah, but um, can you get it in your bolt? Can you get a what? To tension? Oh, yeah. How do you tighten your bolt? Yeah. Uh, yeah, then, uh, with one hand, with one hand, you one hand you and pull. the other one you, because the, the uh -huh. option that you're describing yeah. yep. requires three hands. Mm. <laughs> okay, take a little picture of that and put it into the dock. That's a nice little drawing. I think if you have enough of the belt, if you 
if it's cut with an extra inch, you can hold it with one hand, pull it, and then put the clip underneath from underneath. That's what I did. It came out to be good. Yeah. But you need a plier if you only got a little stump to hold on. Right. Right. This is good if you can do it. Like, but you can't do it on the extruder because the extruder's got too much stuff on one side and the other. So it may not. Will this work on the extruder? The extruder's got its fans and and other components on the sides. Would that still work? Um, hmm? Okay, and then tension it? It's best to make all this before putting the exterior rust. That's like kind of the last step. Everything is locked in. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I like it. Um, do that thing. Yeah. And what, how do you know it's the, what's the least tension? that you can have. How would you test for the least amount? Oh. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. This is what I did is I tried moving from this side, left, right. If there was play, it was not tense enough. If you, if you try to move here, you only get that feedback in one direction. You have to use the other side to test. And what are you testing for? Uh, moving the carriage. Mm -hmm by pulling the opposite side string. If it, yep. if, if it moves without moving the carriage, then it's not tense enough. Yeah, okay, write that down. If the, if the belt moves without moving the carriage, then it's not tight enough. Oh, that's a good, good way to frame it, yeah. Too low tension. Sure. Yeah, I wrote some of this on the third page. You wanna go through that? And the ca the belt moves and not the carriage. Yeah, right? then it's not tight. Okay. So after all this, like maybe we can come up with a different belt clamping mechanism. But but uh, I think this is cool because it doesn't. Uh, I don't know, it's like field adjustable easily. But maybe some people want to say, okay, we'll make this carriage design different so that, because um, this is, you know, it's, it's a bit challenging to get it. First we used friction cl clamps like wedges to wedge the belt in. And then it, that, that kind of gets hard because you got to be very precise on how, on the, on the size of the wedges, you can they can easily be too small or too large. The belt might get loose, or it's too hard to get the and the threading the wedge in the first belt part. might make your head explode. The what? The threading of the belt with these clamps you pointed out is actually not easy. You know, you have to cross them in a certain way. Yeah, that was yeah. We used another thing, but if you're a bit under yeah. stress, at least for me, it can again the brain can lock up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had another way to do it. We moved to this. Uh, we're claiming that the former way was even harder. Um, okay. Yeah. Um. Right. So it's there's detail there. Okay. But the point is that if you have the carriage accurate in terms of tension and you tension the belt properly you've got really good motion at that point and your prints will be pretty good so the only other thing that that can degrade your print quality is if, if your drive gears the the pulleys are not tight but we check that that's all good uh, the motors got to be mounted tight so that motors are not wobbling around but the, those are the three screw little screws uh, that should all be good. So at this point, we're, we're going to have pretty good prints for all of us. So the next thing would would be the electronics. Uh, so let's go quickly through what that all entails. Um, before we move to electronics, just with, you know, we're going to move yep. the mechanical stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just quickly explain why um, any of the parts that we just discussed being mounted, you know, tilted, yeah. Uh, you know, off center things like that. None of that stuff matters. Oh yeah. Oh well, it does matter. To it makes it just a little harder. 
well like we're, we're struggling with some things because of part quality like for example it made it harder on the extruder where it was kind of hard to get some of those bolts in because the things weren't they were the axes were skew so that means i was printing i printed most of it uh ken printed the good parts i printed the shitty parts <laughs> so maybe the if the axis is skewed and that's where i like in in this build i actually paid a lot of attention to make sure my axis is super stiff because because the z axis it can actually twist a little bit this way this way so you got your z axis it can twist a little bit this way if you're not super stiff so even though i try to start to print nice and it was straight maybe the axis like kind of upon moving kind of bent and then it gets skewed prints however oh yeah oh yeah so before we go there uh, to, to answer your question, which things matter? So let's answer that question. And that's going to be, let's do that uh, slide, duplicate slide. So let's, let's examine which things matter for, because there are some alignment, pr alignment procedures such as the bed leveling that happen. So what is, therefore, what is critical and not? So let's do... Uh, call that QC point three. Um, bed level. So what does bed level mean? People say that you don't have to have the bed level or just automatic bed leveling. Well, that's half true. The bed still has to be parallel to the floor. If it's not, you're going to have prints with that basically print at an angle, but they print straight up. That's the way the correction works from how I understand it. Uh, if there's a different bed leveling procedure it's possible that you, your bed is like say not parallel to the floor and you're printing it that way and it actually turns out to be a perfect print you're printing that way that could be possible but that's not how the code works right now that would be an upgrade to Marlin because now you still have to get your bed parallel to the floor now, what about the actual axis that's print? So say you got your, so let's write it down. Bed level, bed must be parallel to ground. And of course you've got some tolerance on that if you're printing a rubber track for your tractor and it's like parallel slightly. To the base plates perhaps? Oh yeah. Well, thing in ground as the earth. Yeah, but it's what it mounted, yeah. Uh, pa yeah, parallel to ground or your table. Because then it keeps parallel to all the other moving parts. Yeah, so in other words, let's, let's draw that out. Um, so that's your bed. Say that's your bed. Uh, we can say that's okay. Um, what's not okay is that. Um, so angle that a little bit. That's not okay. Even though it's within the correction of the bed leveling. What you'll get here, I mean, you'll print this. It will. So the question about auto bed leveling is whether the prints will stick to your table. If you didn't have any bed leveling, then, then if the nozzle is above, in one place, if it's above, your print will not stick, failed print. Uh, so actually we can say here that this is actually both check and cross like it does it both works and it doesn't work because you will print on this the bed leveling will correct for that but um, what do you mean meaning it will follow the surface of the bed yeah ah, okay. and print on the surface Th it will still do that uh, Ken any controversy on that So that it's both good and bad, because the the bad the bad is okay. So let's define what good means. Good means it will print. Prints will stick to bed. 
It will print and prints will stick to bad. Will stick to bad. But print will be crooked at the base. It will be parallel. Your print will be a parallelogram. So the, that's the bad part. Print will be slanted. I mean, not slanted this way. I mean, slanted as in it goes straight up, but the base and top will be slanted. I think. It will be a Maybe effect. check this with Marlin. There's, I mean, there's documentation on Marlin is decent, but it's not great. So look at the forums, see if we see anything else, because maybe by now they actually updated other bed leveling mechanisms. I mean, that's an open source project, so constant, like right now somebody could be working on a different bed leveling mechanism, and there are different algorithms for doing that. So if you're computer savvy, solve this problem and make, make it print better. Like, for example, if you've got that slanted bed and you're actually printing perfect prints on it, that would be an upgrade. So you would be printing like this way, but you'd be printing a perfect print. That would be a great addition to the open source tool chain. Um, so that's, that's what happens. Now, let's talk about the, the actual printer axis, the, the printer arm, which is the X. So let's do slide, duplicate slide. So uh, X axis does not have to be level at all. And how bad, like clearly visible slant. Visible slant and you'll get perfect prints. So let's let's take a look at that. So that's... Um, X axis is the, the table? Uh, that is the Y axis. Sorry, that's the Y axis. Sorry. Okay. So let's do, the, let's say we got a level bed. So let's draw that a little bed, a little there. And now you got a Y axis, sorry, X, X, the extruder axis uh, this is uh, like this kind of thing is a visible slant is perfectly fine like that um, what's the limit of it I haven't tested the limit of it would be where it's so badly slanted that actually it starts hitting things when you print but because the nozzle so the nozzle is going to be like, you know, let's draw the extruder. However it looks, it's your, there's the actual nozzle. As long as the tip of the nozzle is like below any slant. Um, and what is that distance? That distance in the current setup, it's only actually a few millimeters. But um, so actually, let's let's look at uh, so this is okay. This is actually okay. So, so if you think about it, like you've got this, what that means, like say you're printing, you have to just think about the geometry. When will this be acceptable? Like say you got this kind of like forty-five degree angle, will it be accept acceptable? Well. If you're printing <laughs> something that's like on this side of the bed, uh, like it will, I mean, it will still go up and down. Um, so it, the limits are geometrical. Like when will it actually parts of the this axis actually hit your prints? That's that's the limit. It's, it's actually quite interesting when you look at the it's in action printing. You can actually see the z axis doesn't move up step by step. What I mean is, it doesn't move up. It doesn't move up a step and then print and then to the next layer. It's actually constantly it's moving up and down. Yeah. That's what you'll see. The Z correct. axis will constantly correct, correct for the bed not being uh, the axis the or the bed being not parallel to the ground. 
you'll see that. You'll look at your Z, you'll visibly see it moving up and down very gently to follow the contour, the whatever you have. And if you have like little, you know, say you got a concave surface, I think it follows that too. It'll follow a concave surface. So it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be just slanted. It could also be concave, convex, and it'll still work. Okay. Uh, what's the worst? How close do you have to have? What's the tolerance for how off? Because, okay, the whole point is the nozzle has to be right above the bed in order for the print to stick to the bed. You have to press that filament has to like press itself into the bed by the nozzle. So my question to you is if we use a 1.2 millimeter nozzle, what is that tolerance for you to still get good prints? Can you be how high? What's the minimum height you can be and the maximum height you can be and still get perfect prints? Yep. Sorry, I just got my layer height. No, initial adjustment. Like if you're initial, so we set that adjustment. We actually run it for the. F the way we do this is we run the the printer the first time, and we observe how much we have to change the Z height with the knob in order to make the first. Because your probe detects the height, it'll get you close. But up front, you don't know how far the probe is above your nozzle. So you have to find that out for your prints to be accurate. So the first step you do is you actually turn the knob. There's this thing called baby stepping correction, the Z correction. You turn the knob a few millimeters up or down until the print is exactly at the surface. You record that number and you store it in memory. So the question, question I'm asking is how accurate does that number have to be for you to get, like what's the tolerance of this printer for an accuracy on the initial Z height correction, the Z height leveling thing? I'd say at least 0 0.1 millimeter. Above? Like plus or minus 0 0.1. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's a small tolerance. It's like 10%. Yeah, but you can be way more off than that. You got a 1.2 nozzle. You could be as bad off as like at 1.2, as long as some of the bottom is still hitting the surface. So, in other words, with large nozzles, you can have quite a bit of tolerance, like 1.8, even like one millimeter. You'll still get good adhesion. If it's too close, you'll have stuff kind of like squeezing out. The layers will be a little fatter. If you have, if you're at like one above the bed and you're printing. That means only the bottom portion of your filament is going to adhere to the bed, but that could be enough because the, the stickiness on the PEI, the bed that we use, it's really good. So it'll still probably stick and you have a good print. So we actually, by using the large nozzles, we actually have quite a good tolerance for the off, that offset not being correct upon the first time. So I would say that limit is, we can get more explicit about it, but I think it's about probably like more like one millimeter that we can have that setting be off and still get quite good prints. So uh, if you have a 0.4 nozzle, then that distance would be more like 0.3. So it's actually harder. The smaller nozzle you have, the harder it is to get it to print exactly right. Because if you're above 0.4, it's not sticking to the bed. It's not, because you have to have some, a little bit of like physical contact. And maybe, maybe I'm actually off. I've seen it where as long as it's like, it seems like if, even if it's a little bit above that 1.2, it still has like enough of that push that it actually smears it into the surface. So I, I don't know more than that, but it's, it could be like around 1.2 or a little, a tiny bit higher. I wouldn't say, at 2.4, no, probably you might not stick. Um, but 1.2, yeah, you're likely to stick, very likely to stick. And it's a question of percentage. It's not like 0% success. Maybe like if you're, you've got everything just perfect, you've optimized your, pr your printer with more advanced stepper drivers that have smoother steps, which don't vibrate as much and things are more steady. Or if you're going super slow speed, you can still probably get decent prints under like extreme conditions, stuff like that. But anyway, that's just to get an idea. You're gonna be asking like how, okay, how accurate do I have to make that offset? Uh, one millimeter under is good. It, the bigger nozzles make it easier for you to print because you got just higher tolerance. The heat vet helps, I guess. Oh yeah. 
Oh yeah. If you don't have a heat bed, the prints will not stick well. Uh, it won't. They won't stick to this surf to the PI surface. Which we saw this morning. It was not warm enough when they started printing, and it kind of stuck, and then it detached. Yeah. Which was kind of cool to see in a way. And the thing that you have to pay attention to, like, if it's hardly stuck, if it was there just by gravity, and you had no force on it, that would still work. But that's not how it works in reality. If you have like a little blurb, like a little filament of plastic that your nozzle actually hits, that's where you have to have the good adhesion. Sometimes I notice that when you print, like your head is actually hitting the print because it didn't get the, off the initial bed leveling correctly, but it doesn't necessarily fail because if the prints still stick, it will kind of like ride up on them and kind of bump a little bit, but it will actually succeed if you if you got really good adhesion, because it will just kind of like that will all wash out the higher up in the print you go. So that's why the sticking to the bed is important when you have failures, i.e., the the nozzle hitting your print, because there'll be little inaccuracies, little burbles. You might have a little thing thing of filament, like when you jump, like when you do retraction, filament retraction like a little gob spat out that shouldn't be there, like it'll freeze, it'll get solid, and plastic is 4,000 PSI or so. It's one-tenth of steel, um, or one-tenth, one-twentieth of steel. Let's just say one-tenth, but it is solid. I mean, it's quite solid. So a tiny little blurb of plastic that you hit with the nozzle, you can still, you can still shake up your print. So that's why you want adhesion. But, okay, so that's, that does work. Now, let's talk about skew. The skew, you correct. Uh, let's do another thing here. Uh, QC3. So skew. Skew needs to be corrected. Uh, skew is that the x-axis and the y-axis are not perpendicular. So if you look from the top, uh, skew, me so this is the desirable thing. So let's say that's zero. Desirable is a 90 degree angle between the bed, bed axis. So say that's the bed axis looking from the top. And we don't really have any adjustments on that. All you do is you have to take your, your bed axis, put in <coughs> one screw, and rotate to the right angle. Take, a, take an angle to determine uh, the best you can. but. That will be a weak point here. We don't have a good way That's to set like that. It's attached to the base. Yeah. Yeah. We adjust. yeah. 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 So we're basically shimming. Not shimming, but rotating. Rotating. Okay. Yeah. So okay. you're rotating. Yeah, access. You're rotating the bed around one screw. That's all. Yeah. Okay. And get it as tight as you can. And the thing that makes it work for the z-axis must be as stiff as possible. So that's why we did the pipe strap on the motor. That kind of helps it. So the z-axis doesn't need to be 90 degrees as well. Like if that's like. It doesn't need like to be that. 90 degrees. Okay. So let's talk about that skewing. Axes. Like if it's wonky this way and this way. As long as your thing is moving, yeah, it, it doesn't matter it actually. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, that's this it. way. It seems like it has. It to doesn't. Be no. It Not at all. Played. Your it doesn't surface. because uh, the same plane. So okay, so take a look. Uh, let's let's do simulations. This is my print axis going back and forth. What happens when you're like this? The bed z height correction corrects it. It'll okay. it'll be going up and down. What if it's like this? Doesn't matter. Still going this and that. No. Because it's actually moving up and down. It's it's not moving on a single plane. In well. A single print. Or in a single filament line. And it wouldn't have to even be adjusting. If you had this perfect at this little angle and this one is perfectly parallel, it won't yeah. even be Z adjusting. It's just fine that way. As long as there's no physical interference between the uh, extruder and your prints. So it can't be like this, because maybe like then the extruder actually the other part of the extruder actually hits your bed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But no, this is you don't have to have anything here. Is this, but, yeah. but it's Which probably good about? to get everything as level and square. It's good as to be as level because that complication 
will propagate like if something else is off yeah. uh, you might get confused and maybe not able to track down the other thing like that might be an effect that that has on something else I can't really think of a good example of where it would confuse you uh, outside of your perfectionist sensitivity I think that's it just hurts one's ego that's all <laughs> it doesn't hurt print quality okay um, just and let me know otherwise if that's quality, the case but I but not yeah um, the number one and two so skew so needs to be corrected uh, Z vertical is not necessary vertical meanings uh, perpendicular to the ground plane Z vertical is not necessary No, I was just wondering about the Z axis. I mean, it can go in this way, right, and in this way. And yep. it's one way is okay, and the other not. Right? Both are good. We just we just looked at this experiment. We were going this way. Say you're like this. Doesn't affect it. You're moving like this. No, the skewness skewness is the thing that can't happen. Yeah. Skewness can't happen. You'll get skewed prints. But um, yeah. because the x axis I'm claiming, but. The Z is skewed in one way, the X axis... Will be skewed, but it will be... Well, I mean, it will tilt, but the Z correction will, will fix that. Okay. Right? I think so. Okay. Um, we'll, you know, you'll see it in action today. Um, That's it. Yeah, I would love to see that, actually. You know, screw up the, the axis... Yeah, and, and, and intentionally yeah, make it slanted yeah, and yeah. see if you get the a perfect is believing. Plane. Okay, You're going to get a uh, parallelogram. If you're skew, if you skew axis. not if you're not vertical. And that's what I claim. Okay. I think. Um, let's see some. Skew let's see prints. some. Now Prusa has <laughs> auto. So how do you do auto skew? <laughs> auto skew correction. So Prusa brags about auto skew, skew correction. They actually developed it. So that is actually open source software. But what they will do is they have four markers on the bed, or what, however many markers. They probe them. They find their location by like whatever inductive sensor or whatever and then they see oh this this is actually a parallelogram and they will correct that in the software so you can actually have skewed axes and it will correct that out we can apply that to this printer if we have a uh, basically sense four points so you have to fix like four sensing points um, that are maybe how do they do that I think they have um, the bed is not metal like it would be because the way a, a, an inductive probe works it works on metals well so you could like probe four points that are the same uh, pieces of metals which you know their location That's and you can calculate exact screws in or something or pins maybe you or could do the opposite drill holes and you know where the sensor doesn't yeah goes off. That's yeah That's one part. You do something like that yeah various ways to do it but that that's a high value upgrade for this system we don't have that installed we don't do that and that will definitely improve the value of this printer so um, so skew here so this is okay um, what's not okay is is Um, so if you do a little bit of skew, a little bit like that, that's not okay. So how does one actually calibrate that? Calibrate which part? The skew? Yeah. With the right angle. You take a look at from above, you, you kind of so lay them. So you drop the two axes yeah. as close as possible yeah. to each other and try and just do it with, a, with an, angle. an angle. And you just screw it in at the right place. You don't yeah. throw a three, four, five, one, two, three, or something, try You it. can. Yeah. The square already has that. <laughs> it does, but. Yeah, you can make measurements and longer bigger, points. Yeah. You get much more accuracy. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. Um, or you could 3D print a base that's accurate and put it into points that you are that are already pre-measured. That would be an upgrade to this system. 
Yeah. We would print maybe a little template or even a printout. Yeah. Even a printout on a sheet of paper that shows you exactly, you put laid over the bed, you screw into exactly where it tells you to put it. That's easy to implement. template to put screws in to see what, what uh, it is. Uh, yeah. 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 That a little template will actually help quite a bit. That's easy to implement a printout. Um, so I was going to actually, let, let's correct this page if we think it's not okay, but we're saying that, uh, so if you change, so if we say um, bed axis, and that's the Z axis, it's good to leave the extruder name on there though. That's the z-axis. So I'm just showing z-axis and y-axis. That is okay. We're claiming that. And after today, maybe we revisit this page and say it's not okay. But this is okay at this point. <laughs> um, you know, you'll see it on the printers. We'll probably have something like that, which is probably clearly visible on some printers. Uh, yeah. Uh, so electronics, you want to go in quick into electronics? Okay. So let's look at this full guide by John, who built the D3D Pro. He got a kit. He wants to be a builder too. Um, And that's on his printer that he built. So, okay, what are the elements? We said the extruder has got like seven things on it. We've got three axes. We got two end stops. We got quite a bit of things. So, we got power. We got power from the wall. We got power to the bed. Where's all this go? So, this is step by step. Um, extruder. What's on extruder? We got the Lower heater block. Lower. Yeah, a few elements. So let, let's go through each slide so that, that you can just follow this exactly and you can say, I got stuck on the step on page two. So this is page two. Can you do the extruder heater? Does that make sense? So that's the top pin of that block of those blue, blue pins. It's called D10. Uh, it's labeled D10, D10 on a ramps board. So here, this is pictorial. It's not even doing any labeling. Uh, you can... We can uh, have you actually edit this if you want. So we can say... Anyone in turn with this this link can edit. So I'll paste that into the chat box if you want. Okay. Pictorially, does this make sense? The upper upper two terminals that are blue. If you're looking at it, at the extruder, can you? Can you identify which way the ramps board is pointing there, based on the the blue connectors? So if you like, you have to be able to identify that which is up and down on the extruder board. Like, which which way are you actually looking at it? If you're looking at this diagram. Right 
You're looking from above, first of all. <laughs> okay. You're looking from <laughs> above of the ramps board. You're looking down at it. Yeah, but the screen in our setup is on the left side. If we're looking from above. Uh, yeah, uh, these are... Okay. <laughs> What's accurate about this is the connections to the ramps here. Don't worry about the other things yet. Okay. That's how the control panel actually looks on a Pro, but it's not on a Universal. Okay. But does this make sense for how the ramps, which way it's facing? Yes. You'll see D10 is the, where this actually goes. So my next question is, does polarity matter? Because that's the only thing you got to watch out for. Polarity does matter in cases. In other cases, it doesn't. In cases where it doesn't, you don't have to worry about it. In case it does, you better get it right or, or it won't work. But So the important question to ask is, does polarity ma matter in this situation? It's a resistor. Does polarity matter? No. 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 So you can plug in what the red wires from the extruder heater, one or the other, into D10. D10 plus or minus. It doesn't matter. Any questions? Keep going. Extruder blower. So now the blower. That's D9. Polarity does matter. Those those leads are black and red. And it's minus and plus, as in the order shown. Uh, maybe we can zoom up a little bit. Red is plus. Black is minus. It will be labeled on a board. Hopefully. And that's the blower, not the fan. This fan and blower. Blower is the snail looking thing. That's the print cooling blower. The fan is the cooling fan. The blower cools your prints so that you can print more accurately, faster. The, the fan cools the extruder so it works. So the extruder actually works and, and the filament doesn't melt within the heat break. If we mess this up, it's going to suck air? Or it's not working? And that's a... No, it's not going to... This one's not going to spin. Let's turn off the volume on that. And I don't like extruder fan. This is actually extruder blower. Or is it actually the fan? I think that's the... No, that's the blower. So, okay, fan... We're not calling that the fan. Uh, they're both fans, like in general, but it's it's let's distinguish between blower and fan. So this is blower, print cooling what blower. What happens if you uh, maybe you asked? What, what happens if you? It won't move? spin. Okay. It won't even do the opposite direction. It just won't spin. Mm. Okay. Oh, you mean uh, if you get the plus minus wrong? Yeah. Well, what if you replace the fan and the heater, or the blower and the, or the blower and the fan? What they that will mean is that they run the same voltage, right? Yeah, it will yeah. work, yeah. but you won't the get prints. The would be, yeah, of course. It w you wouldn't get prints because the blower turns on. Not all. It's not on all the time. At the beginning of a print, mm -hmm. it's not on. The fans heat sink. The that part, the cooling, that has to be on all the time. So that's plugged into the permanent power. Yeah. All right. Okay. Next. Right. Hmm. I was gonna say that for my experience. Um, when I was doing it, wasn't clear which was which, so I had actually had them swap. So because the the heatsink fan is supposed to run all the time. Yes. And I had it swapped, so it was the blower that was running all the time, and my prints were not. Sometimes they come out okay, sometimes it, 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 it messes your prints up. Yes, yeah, right. And it could mess up a clog because. Yeah, if okay. the if that turns off, you won't be able to extrude. If the if the fan turns off, you won't be able. Typically, you'll clog. Yes, I have some. That's called clogging. Yeah, it's overheats. The heat break transports more heat. The filament break like melts closer to the spaghetti. It's spaghetti, closer to spaghetti. <laughs> Next, what is this thing? That's the bed. Heat bed. 
So what are we doing there? We're doing a solid state relay. Now, there's two things here. One, polarity matters, and two, which side of the solid state relay are you connecting to? There's input and output, so you have to get that right. There's, it's labeled in and out. The inside has to be DC, three to 32 volts. It's a small voltage DC. The opposite side is AC. Won't work if you flip that. It's so that's that. Should be clear. Now, this is five volt power. So you've got these, take a look at this video, but there's a little, or look at my printer. Um, uh, so I finished mine last night by 11.30. It's all wired up, it's ready to, to run, ready to be connected and tested. Here's uh, those headers, and there's a pin, a double white pin, and you can probably see it in the video. What is that thing? It's a, so it's, the five volts is these upper ones the here. Section, we have positive on top, negative on the bottom, so red, black, that's going right here. And there's that double white plug. Polarity matters. It's like the bottom two. Red is the pl plus is on the left. And then um, plus there is at the top or bottom? Is that the five volts? It's at the top. Arino, yes. The yes, that's five volts fed through the USB. We're f so we're hacking this. We're feeding five volts to trigger the heat bed because we can uh, otherwise you'd have to put 12 volts in there why don't we do 12 volts I don't know this was because it was very convenient to just plug take 5 volts off anywhere in the board because the board has 5 volts throughout we just said okay let's take the 5 volts use that to trigger it, that feeds the what you see above there that's the actual heat bed so this power to here actually is what comes out of that as a trigger. So that's the power feed to the heat bed. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's five volts. That's five volts. We're feeding the solid state relay with five volts. If you want to yeah, know, it's a signal. It's a signal. Oh yeah, before it was power. So this is uh, just for your understanding. Before this was actually producing power, like a few amps, like 10 amps to do heating of the heat bed. That would always burn out these terminals and these terminals. So we're just turning into signal and using an external power element, the solid state relay. So Therefore the, the, the board. Hmm? That was the power feed to what you were coming to? Heat bed. So that means a bunch of amps. So that was like 10 amps or, or something <coughs> like that. Which, which this turns it to, this will never burn out. Okay, five volts. So a little double plug. Those are actually red, readily there. They're, they're the thing from the fan. We're saving those the fan, fan cutoffs, for this purpose. Putting uh, putting what on it? Putting the ferrules, the, the terminals on them, using that crimper, and feeding that into those two there. So all these terminals have ferrules. That's a way to get a nice clean connection into there that doesn't fray and break over time. Ferrules are those little crimps. The cylindrical crimps. Extruder fan and power supply. Okay, so now we're talking about the fan, the, the extruder fan. Uh, that's on all the time. It connects to where the 24 volt power supply connects. Polarity matters. Where's the out, output of the power supply? It says 24, it's that those blue terminals. It's not those green ones. The green ones are the power in to the, to the power supply. We're using the small power supply because we can. We don't need a big one. Does that make sense? Somewhat. So, you, yeah, you're connecting the power supply. Yeah. The important thing to note there is blue connectors, not those green ones. Uh, watch the videos. Extruder motor. So now that's a four-fold connector, right? That's a four-wire plug, those, the multicolor rainbow thing. That's the extruder. It's the upper left thing. Um, you have to change the wire configuration for the right 
if so the the wires should feed through that they should not cross from one end one end of the wire and the other end of the wire should be the same color code color order order if it's crossed we gotta take a little pin and remove the connect like remove the pins and switch them on a black side black side is e the white you can disconnect the, both the white and black but the black one is easier to disconnect so make the switching on a on the black. I put a cross there because we're typically we're not using that. We only need four channels, not five. You'd be using that if you were doing like that. Yeah. Use yep. That as another driver. Yep. And for some people, we use the so both of, both of those, both this one and that one, drive the Y. So you could no. connect to either actually. So you you, you can actually choose. In the case where some of the drivers were hard to insert at the bottom. We just put it at the top because it's actually a little easier to insert it at the top because it's not sandwiched between two other ones and it's kind of tight there. Gotcha. Next. X motor. So this is the four-fold wires, once again. That's the, the X. Okay, that is actually... Yeah, where does it go? Yeah, right. That's a little detail there I'd like to see more of. So let's detail that. So that goes, that's going to here, to this one, to, to those. Those are the four fourfold headers, the black, black or white plug, depending which wires you have. Okay. And are they, are they coded such that you cannot, you know, put them in the wrong way? Uh, no, you could. Coded, I think, not the black one or? The ones that go in a particular way are the ones that the motor, you can say they have particular, but the thing is if you reverse those, the motor direction changes. That's what happens. So that's how we, do, we don't pay attention to what the direction, how you plug it in. We just watch which way does the motor move and change that. It, that is much easier than actually paying attention because it's very hard to do this correctly because you have to keep more than one thing in mind at one time. People can only hold one thing <laughs> at a time in their mind. Uh, when you're doing like this kind of physical stuff, it's hard to remember a lot of things. Things So we just say, just plug it in, watch where the how the motor moves. If it moves the right direction, you're good. If not, reverse the plug, that's all. Next. Oops. Y motor. Okay, so what, so by the way, X, which is the X axis? Because we, we just said X, but what's the X axis? Which, which one is that? Yeah, the one hanging on the Z. The X is the extruder axis. X for extruder. The Y is for the bed. So Y, this is the bed axis, plugs into either one of those actually. Here it has Y motor one and two, because there's two there. Here you choose one or the other, just plug into whichever, where, wherever you put in the, the driver, the little chip, the little board. Watch the video as if you got questions. Z motor, yes, we have a Z motor, the Z axis. That goes either one of those two. Um, in this case, they actually have two. In our case, we have one. Okay. So choose either one of those, two sets of four. End stops now. So end stops, some people started getting to that. Uh, those are the three threefold wires, three prong wires here. This is the X end stop. So I have green, black, Green and is red. at the top. That one goes to right here. The so X. the X is the end stop, stop. you put on so your uh, red. extruder axis. Black, green. You can only plug it in one way on the end stop itself. But there you can plug it one way or the other, so make sure the green is facing to the top. Otherwise, the system, you won't get proper triggering of end stops. So... Question. This yep. board is in the end of the build, is visible in yours. Yeah, we can actually... It's yeah. not covered by another board on top. Okay, good. This is all visible. Okay, good. Why end stop? So it's the one next door, but it's not right next door. It's actually three over. Why? Why is it three over? This one right there. That's the Y. 
it's just what it is like the, you can have n stops at the minimum position like zero or the max so those there's six n stop plugs because you can put them x minimum or maximum y minimum maximum z minimum maximum what we have is x min and y max details but it's if you're wondering why it's four over instead of like right next to it so if there's you like a minimum to mount it on the other end yeah you could put plug then in you'd have to change some of the programming because it's yeah. thinking and looking for it on that end yes but yeah so that's both in firmware you have to change that so and in a physical where you plug it in physically <laughs> Stick with it. So this is the plan. Y end stop. Z end stop, which is the height probe. That's an end stop too. It's just an inductive sensor. The other one's triggered by a physical trigger. This one triggers by induction. It turns on when it senses metal. Meaning it's close to the bed. It senses between 4 and 8 millimeters. It triggers as far as eight millimeters away so that's the Z you got temperature sensors thermistors so there's that where are those those are those header pins okay right here we have red and black they're below below okay. the end stops there that's gonna be the extruder thermistor there's six of them so, so you're that, using those wires become use the first two sets if you from left and they they're right there they wrap around they go inside and they're right in in there so the thermistor is inside the heater block there So this is called extruder thermistor, this is bed thermistor. So you got the bed has a heat sensor to tell you what temperature it's at. And you control that to make it 60 for PLA typically. The extruder typically run at like 230C, but you have to have feedback. You gotta tell, you gotta, it's gotta tell you what temperature it's at so you can turn it on and off. It, that's the software does that. So you got feedback on this. Next, power cords in bed. Okay, power cords. And I imagine one needs a different temperature for different materials, potentially. Yep, that's correct. So, um, so power. So we have, we're just using. Here we use these plugs. Um, well, let's see which. There's a bunch of videos there, but on this connector we have the obviously. See the that plug there? Uh, we have these power plugs which you open up and do the wires inside. Um, I like to get away from it. It's kind of hard to fit four wires in them, so we're just migrating to a regular plug, snip it off, and make two connections. One goes to the bed, one goes to the power supply. So basically, cut off the plug, double it, one end goes to heat bed, other end goes to inserts of power supply. But the details are so. Um, do you want to watch these videos together? Or, yeah, well, I'll, I'll show you out there. Yeah, I think What's it's better. For me, like, all this is... Way better with the I, I have to have physical stuff in my hand or it's pretty much useless. Okay, so this is, since this is useless, let's not useless, just, but it's semi, but it's, it's easier, better. yeah. You can refer to it once yeah. you, once you see the thing. So if maybe I we can... Concrete, I will do much better. So there's LCD panel next usb power yeah that's it we can go out there and look at all these connections yeah i think let's do that okay so it's 11 30. uh should we go out there and go over the wiring in, in real and then we can do that um so the Say again? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, so we we're going 
gonna go back and we're gonna basically uh, start where we all end. Okay, do you want to take a look at the electrical connections or not yet then? I, I, I mean, I, but other people are, so I think they, they probably yeah. would want I think it, so. I think we can maybe actually start yeah. heading down that way. Um, I think kind of, I, I guess I can't say for the rest of the guys, but I'm sure we've seen enough to kind of give us an idea. Yeah. So when you are showing us here, we know what you're talking about. I have an idea. How about people that have already, like, uh, are in the wiring, well, I mean, look, the, the concept of everybody helping the people first person done, that still applies, man. I mean, otherwise there's going to be like a bunch of people not finished. Yeah, but I think that the way it's been working out is, you know, some people just work slower, even if they understand it, they don't silly work, yeah. you know. And some want to be helpful. Yeah, but those people you should beat repeatedly until they catch this idea. Um, forgive me if I if I completely missed the uh, the plan of action, but what did we decide to to, to do in terms of starting uh, the tractor build? Uh, I think we decided that we're gonna focus on on getting a lot of people finished on a printer with a quality control, because I think there were important quality control points that we didn't have yet. Okay. Now we have it, so we'll just leave it to do it that today and start on tractor tomorrow, okay. looks like, in all practicality. Yeah, that, that doesn't matter what happens today, tomorrow we should start on that. Everybody will right. start okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we go to the, well, it's 11.30. Right? Yeah, so we can go to the workshop, um, whoever's ready. Okay. Yes, sir. Sure. Thank you.